Why stay in a boring, mundane, cookie-cutter hotel when you could stay in a treehouse or a boat in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico? How about something even more unique, like a hobbit hole? Oh, sorry, a hobbit-style underground cabin. Or, or a windmill. Oh, none of these tickle your fancy? How about a f***ing spaceship? It'll be an easy, convenient process to have a unique experience and a larger space for less of the cost and a nice time with family or friends. What could possibly go wrong? What started as a really cool, unique, and affordable way to travel became synonymous with horror stories and cleaning fees. And it wasn't even that clean when you got there. Airbnb used to have that edge over hotels since they were about the same price or even cheaper. But you had a kitchen, privacy, and sometimes a really cool yard with a hot tub just for you. You don't even have to share it with someone's sweaty uncle at a hotel. Now you share it with your sweaty uncle. But now, prices can get pretty steep, and you have to go on a scavenger hunt with your luggage to find the key to your stay. And you have to do chores before you leave. This might be my inner 10-year-old, but I don't want to do chores on vacation. I just don't. With complaints from both landlords and tenants, and complaints from entire cities for disrupting their housing market, causing rent and home prices to rise, today my cynical ass is going to be bringing you down this very deep dive of everything wrong with Airbnb. Oh man, dude, who cares? I don't remember asking. I can still hear you. Blah blah blah, everything wrong with Airbnb. How about I tell you everything right with the sponsor of today's video, Aura? You can thank Aura for this video because deadlines prevent me from procrastinating. Procrastinating. Like how you're procrastinating getting Aura, what are you doing? They're an all-in-one privacy protection service that protects your personal information online that's been blasted on all these data broker websites. Addresses, full names, relatives' names, phone numbers, all of that. Gone. And they're constantly monitoring for your information without you having to lift a single one of those beautiful fingers of yours. Oh no no no, no lifting for you. Oh no no. Right now, I'm on that hustler grind set where I'm making money moves. And Aura alerts me every time a company views my credit report. And after I'm done, I lock my credit report so no one else can request that information without my permission or me knowing about it. I have my entire family on Aura and you should too, if you want. Go to Aura.com slash GabbyBell to try 14 days free and let Aura go to work at protecting your information online. Thanks to Aura for sponsoring and back to 2022, a family of five and a dog booked an Airbnb apartment in a US city for the holidays. They wanted enough room for the whole family with some added privacy that hotels usually don't have. Arriving at 10 a.m. from the airport, the Airbnb host had not yet sent them the instructions to get the key out of the lockbox to unlock the apartment, nor did he respond to any of the messages from the family. Like a hotel, they chose to pay a little extra to check in early at 10 a.m. Waiting around with their bags in an unfamiliar city all day, the Airbnb host finally replies at 4 p.m sharp with instructions on how to get the key. They show up to the apartment, park, follow piss poor instructions and conduct a game of hide and seek to unlock a lockbox, to then get the key, to enter the apartment six hours after they were supposed to, only to find out that there was no parking pass for the garage as advertised, and parking is $20 a day. And there is dog piss on the bed, freshly wet. Now what? They requested a refund from Airbnb. There's nowhere else to stay in the city because everything is booked for the night. And best of yet, the Airbnb host doesn't believe them and won't refund the Airbnb. <laughs> that family was mine. In early 2020, we booked a stay in Key West. The boat was advertised like this, but what we got was more like this. <laughs> A boat that was half under construction, topped with no running water in the bathroom. And Airbnb stories exactly like or worse than mine are not hard to come by. You or someone you know may have been affected by holy shit I'm never staying in an Airbnb ever again disease. From horrible hosts, to catfishing properties, to nightmare stays, to Airbnb hosts being accused of putting hidden cameras in their properties, and being accused of negatively affecting housing markets, Airbnb has become a huge player in the short term 
short-term rental industry, and massively influential in creating competition to the hotel industry entirely, as travelers started to choose a cozy, private Airbnb experience than a commodified hotel one. But with the laundry list of problems and controversies Airbnb has had since their birth in 2008, the reign of piss-covered bedsheets might finally be in decline. So exactly how it works, Airbnb is just a hub for individuals renting out their own homes as vacation rentals and for travelers to book them. Airbnb doesn't own the properties and they're not a real estate company. When Airbnb was born in 2008, it got big pretty quickly. It was a way for homeowners to rent out a property that they already own for most of the year when they're not using it to make a little extra cash. And it was flexible since it was a short-term rental, unlike a long-term time and legal commitment. And Airbnb only takes around a 3% fee of the booking subtotal from the host. On the other side of the equation, travelers wanted something different than just a cookie cutter hotel, perhaps with more space for larger groups and families, often at a very affordable price in areas that didn't have quality hotels. It changed the travel industry entirely. Airbnb is the Spotify of hospitality, completely changing the game, which is why it popularized so fast. And having all the real estate be provided by site users, it allowed Airbnb to scale really big really fast, without having that upfront cost of buying 6 million homes around the world. But both the guest and the host have to be satisfied for this to work. Some guests are chill and clean and Others won't leave your property for 575 days. Or they'll leave physical damage to the property, like frat boys and punching holes through walls. Some hosts are nice and responsive, and others will install hidden cameras to watch you in the bathroom, or wear your socks when you leave. It can be a nightmare for both sides. So much so that you might even consider selling your five investment homes. Aww, a goo goo gaga. In this economy, really? You have at least one home. Be happy with that. Steven. Airbnb has gained a reputation of being hit or miss, and I kind of noticed this to be the case with other self-governing jobs like Uber, grocery delivery. A service that does such a bad job of quality control where the customer experience is inconsistent makes customers feel like it's a high-risk gamble every time they use your service. And that goes for restaurants, hotels, any of these types of businesses. Heck, even the fake job of a YouTuber. <laughs> Consistency is partially the key to why many are successful. Inconsistent services like Uber have almost just become a thing that you use only when you have to or don't have any other choice. And in my opinion, that's haunting over the Airbnb business model no different. If you have a large group or destination where there aren't many quality hotels around, Airbnb is kind of the only other way to go. And sure, it's nice to have the option, but it's a gamble if it's going to be an okay experience. At least that's how I've started to use it after so many plain bad stays. And if I'm not more delusional than I already am, most of you probably agree. Maybe. Amazon is a type of service like this that I think has solved this quality control problem. A caveat though, only at huge scale and not paying your workers enough. Amazon is a hub for third-party sellers to sell things. They're essentially a middleman, but unlike eBay, Amazon has gotten more involved with the quality of their service at every step of the way. With their own website delivery drivers, it's not FedEx, it's not USPS, it's not UPS, it's not the SATs, it's not USAA, it's not USA, it's not DiGiorno, it's Amazon delivery. Instead of each seller being responsible for shipping out orders and holding in, inventory, most Amazon sellers give their product in bulk to Amazon for Amazon to store in Amazon warehouses. Then Amazon has control over the delivery times, inventory, shipping, returns, beans, potatoes, tomatoes, beans, greens, potatoes, tomatoes, lamb, rams, hogs, dogs, shipping, returns, everything to ensure that from purchase to getting their product, the customer has a consistent experience. Airbnb could mimic this model by owning some of their own properties, or having Airbnb owners allow Airbnb to take control of the managing process entirely. But they don't want to do that. They're not a real estate company. They market themselves as a tech company. And in the big boy business world, that's very different. They don't want the legality of dealing with incidents happening on company property, or the legal responsibility of ensuring compliance with city or state rental regulations. 
hands. They just want to put it in their terms of service and wash their hands of it. Kind of like the hidden cameras found in Airbnb scandal. You guys remember that? In the past maybe five or so years, I don't know an exact time frame on this, it started going viral when people started finding hidden cameras in their Airbnbs. You might think that scandal was just hysteria and one news case caused mass panic for no reason, but there are news reports as recent as yesterday of guests finding hidden cameras in their Airbnbs. Thousands of different hosts doing this. Why are hosts still getting away with this? Not to mention all the weird, gross, and predatory stuff hosts have done to their guests. Sure, a guest might break a wall, but a host might do this. Or this. <laughs> Or even this. Do they not background check before letting someone become a host? When you sign up for Airbnb and want to stay somewhere, you have to upload a photo ID to make sure you're a real person and accounted for. But to host someone on your property, surely you'd need like a background check or something, right? Right? Guys? So I'm going to see just how easy it is to list a property on Airbnb. Okay, after clicking like one button, it brings me to this page, Airbnb it, you could earn $1,700. So first it introduces you to, to say, look how much money you're gonna make. Look how much money you're gonna make if you list on Airbnb. So I already started one for from researching earlier, but you just have to click create new listing, get started. Tell us about the place. Let's say I have a house. I have an entire house, and I'm going to enter in an address that doesn't exist and see if Airbnb knows that it doesn't exist or knows it's not a residence. So this is a park in Ohio. No one actually lives here, and let's see if Airbnb detects that. Okay, yep, that is perfect. Good pin. You can have four guests. I got two bedrooms. I got four beds. <laughs> two bathrooms. I hope this isn't illegal. I'm not actually going through with it. Let's say you got a pool lake access and you can ski in ski out okay now we have to add some photos and i just downloaded five random photos i found online when i googled a nice house perfect these are all definitely the same place give your house a title <laughs> i can't spell okay yeah sure it's unique definitely family friendly i don't even want to write a description i don't care finish up and publish Set your price. Sure, that sounds good to me. I can choose to have these promotions for weekly discounts or monthly discounts or a new listing promotion. Last step, do you have security cameras, weapons, or dangerous animals? And it's time to publish. And it hasn't asked me a single thing <laughs> about my identity or a background check or anything. It didn't detect that the address is actually at a local park. And I'm not gonna publish because I fear that the law will be upon me if I do. So I'm going to save an exit for now. Okay, so I didn't need to upload any proof that I owned the property, any paperwork proving it's me, no SSN to check my background or anything like that. And if you go to my host profile as a guest, you'll see that my identity was confirmed because when I did sign up for Airbnb, I uploaded my driver's license and that's about it. Email address and phone number. And that's about all you get. Learn about identity verification. Someone being identity verified or having I identity verification badge only means that they have provided info in order to complete our identity verification process. This process is not a guarantee that someone is who they claim to be. Yeah, pr pretty much. Even Uber background checks their drivers. When there's a clear power imbalance and safety concerns, Airbnb should absolutely be background checking and digging deeper to verify hosts. But if I want to host in a spot like Amsterdam that requires a permit to do so, let's see how easy that is. Okay, so this one is gonna require me to input more information. Meet local requirements. Your local government asks that hosts complete some tasks before starting to host. Okay, so it does require me to have a registration number with Amsterdam in order to list on Airbnb. Or I could just not do that. I can just claim that I'm exempt from having a license, like I don't need it and they said it was okay and I can just lie about it. And I can just check this off, be like, I understand that this is all true and then hit next but i'm not going to because i am a law-abiding citizen so there you have it it gets a very easy out of 10 for me
I forgot to explain that I just got a boo-boo. Just don't question it. I just, I got a boo-boo and I put a band-aid over it. Let's not talk about it anymore. And this is a pimple sticker, okay? <laughs> Airbnb has since added a no hidden camera rule in their terms of service a couple different times. I'm so sure that will solve the problem. <laughs> Good job, Airbnb, you solved it. But Airbnb doesn't actually do anything to make sure the person that's hosting people on their property is safe. No interview, no background check. I can easily put a fake name in there and I'm sure many people do. And unless someone finds the hidden cameras and reports the host, it's really hard to get caught. The host usually gets kicked off of Airbnb.com. They may or may not get fined by the city if they're unlicensed. Sometimes the host gets arrested and sometimes the host gets sued but Airbnb itself never seems to get sued. It's always Airbnb owner gets sued. Now that doesn't mean that Airbnb doesn't get sued. I did find one legitimate lawsuit where this listing was infested with bats and the suit alleges that Airbnb negligently allowed the infested home to be advertised on its platform and that the homeowner and those responsible for maintenance failed to ensure that the home was safe for renting. I mean, that's what I've just been saying. Also pretty recently as of making this video, Airbnb is getting sued because there's a new law in New York City that allows landlords to put their buildings on a do not register list, which is supposed to automatically block tenants from listing those apartments on the website. But they're getting sued because Airbnb allegedly continues to allow those listings in their buildings, despite their inclusion on the do not register list. I mean, you saw how easy it was to list an Airbnb. They do barely the bare minimum of making sure that you're even allowed to do so. So I just wanna ask, at what point is a company responsible for not regulating its users enough? People kind of brought this up with Facebook a while ago being used in nefarious ways. And that's a conversation I think needs to be had here as well. How are you not background checking your hosts? Now, I'd personally rather spend about the same amount of money to get a relatively consistent and quality experience that I know I'm signing up for when I book a hotel. If there's a problem, like vanilla ice, the hotel will solve it. If a complaint is filed, against someone not doing their job properly, it'll probably get fixed, unlike Airbnb. <laughs> Airbnb's notoriously bad support is another reason people kind of hesitate to book on their site. If something gets delivered from Amazon in bad condition, not as advertised, or completely got sent the wrong item, Amazon's return system is one of the best in online commerce. Pay your workers more, please. If you show up to a hotel with, say, dog piss on the bed and a dirty sink, someone will be up pretty quickly to clean it, if not just comping you a free room entirely. If the same thing happens at an Airbnb, Good fucking luck. It's endless sending of proof to a support live chat. Receipts, photos, videos, he said, she said by Ashley Tisdale, and it very quickly and easily turns into a huge mess, only resulting in maybe getting some of your stay refunded. It makes sense that they need proof, but it's just a worse experience than a hotel. Say it with me, if it's an Airbnb bust when you show up, your shit out of luck. You end up having to go to a nearby hotel and hope they have a room open, then you pay for that, and then go through the refund process with Airbnb. With shoddy support and risky bookings leading to endless horror stories, it's no wonder that Airbnb's hosts have been reporting steep declines in bookings that were once packed this fall, or is it? You see, like Alex Russo said, everything is not what it seems, and this is only the icy tip of the Airbnb iceberg. This isn't the full story, and we'll get to that later. But first, we must understand something. At a hotel, we're all familiar with the process, right? You book online or by calling, and you show up, you pay, you enjoy your stay bars. Then you pack up, you give your card back to the front desk, and you get the fuck out of there. The margin for error is pretty calculated and slim. So long as you know what type of hotel you're booking, you're not going to be running into any huge surprises most of the time. At an Airbnb though, since Airbnb is so hands-off in their business model and approach, there are an almost endless amount of ways that an Airbnb stay can go wrong. Professor Balls, take it away. Once you've found your little slice of life on Airbnb.com, you get to see the Airbnb service fee before booking. Not too different from a hotel service fee and tax. And then you see a near $200 cleaning fee 
tacked on on top of that. It's okay because you usually get 48 hours to cancel without a cancellation fee, except for when there is. Now your one night, $200 stay has literally doubled in price because the cleaning fee is almost as much as the nightly rate. Now you arrive at your Airbnb and it's time to go on the most annoying, unskippable fetch quest to start your stay. I've checked into Airbnbs in Tokyo, Amsterdam, and all across the US, and it's always the damn same. The host sends you a video tutorial maybe and at least a three paragraph text on how to find your key. Assuming they send that information to you before you arrive, usually your key lives on one of those lockbox things that are f***ing somewhere on the premise and you have to enter in the code they send you to get the key to unlock the front door. It's like a goddamn Zelda puzzle. The directions for these will be like, turn left on the street two blocks away and ask the man in the jumper for directions. He will then tell you a riddle that you have to solve that will lead you to the lockbox that's behind a parking garage door on the third flight of stairs on a Tuesday. And also beware of the vicious animals. And keep in mind, usually by this point you're carrying around a ton of luggage and you are exhausted from traveling. Even if you skipped the whole key side quest and you scored a place with a lock pad where you can enter in the numbers to get in, hosts will usually not send you the code until your feet are touching the mat and you're standing there waiting around and then they tell you the code but they don't tell you all the extra little buttons that you have to press to make the code work and then they don't respond. Or maybe I just have really bad luck. There are benefits and drawbacks. On the plus side, most B&Bs have full kitchens, maybe a washer dryer, and some privacy. And those are some of the main benefits compared to staying in a hotel. On the other hand, you don't get your room cleaned or room service to bring you more towels because your Airbnb stocked you with two towels the entire stay. If you rented a home, chances are you might have gotten a place with a backyard, a pool, hot tub, grill, and all that. And since you paid for the stay, you might think you're open to using those amenities on the property, like at a hotel where you can use all that for free. Are you kidding? Obviously there's gonna be a fee for the hot tub and a heads up to the host because they have to come turn it on for you. And of course there's an extra fee for using and a fee for cleaning the grill. But you have a good time. Sometimes it's really just a place to sleep anyway. And it's time to leave. I don't know about you. Don't. But most of the time I get no checkout instructions and what to do with the keys and I just have to guess. Other than that, we're all familiar with the list of chores you're given before you check out. In my personal experience, I've been asked to wash the dishes, run the dishwasher, take out the trash and replace the bag, remove the bedding and put it into the washing machine. Oh, and remember that $200 cleaning fee you paid for? That's almost as much as this day itself. And of course it's common courtesy to not leave the place looking like your local frat had a party there. But when the customer feels like they're being nicked and dimed the entire stay, paying the cleaning fee and expecting to do said cleaning, I'm just gonna stay in a hotel next time if I can. There's a lot that can go- ah. Oh. There's a lot that can go wrong at every step. So let's talk about one of the main points of contention people bring up when criticizing Airbnb. One of the main Airbnb complaints that I see are about these damn cleaning fees. On Twitter, I asked what people wanted me to cover in this video, and a big chunk of them were about this. What gives them the audacity to ask us to do the laundry before we leave? Why do they charge cleaning fees if we have to clean it ourselves and they are always dirty? Now I'm going to give you an answer you don't like, and it's because they can. But let me explain. Hotels hire staff to take care of cleaning. They have all the rooms in one place, and it's easy for them to bring the cart around and clean room by room in an efficient and timely manner. You might not know, but Airbnb cleaning fees are up to the host to take care of. Airbnb doesn't require cleaning fees and they don't enforce them. Cleaning is either done by the host themselves or the host hires a cleaning service to do it. Whether or not you think the landlord should be making extra money on top of the stay to clean their Airbnb is your opinion. But what we don't think about is that these cleaning services actually do charge them. That much. Without the efficiency of hotels, it's simply more expensive to hire a maid service. And with the Airbnb host being responsible for the cleaning, that explains why the cleanliness of a rental can 
vary. It varies from cleaner to cleaner or company to company, but a typical two-bedroom apartment in the US is around $200 to clean. And the listings are usually bigger than a hotel and are spread out geographically, so it's not as efficient in cost or time. Anyway, according to an analysis by NerdWallet, the median cleaning fee on Airbnb in 2023 per listing for a one-night stay is $75. For larger places or if they hire out cleaning help, the median cost increases to $105. People can't help but think that some of these cleaning fees are being pocketed by the hosts, or if not that, being disingenuously high in order for their Airbnb listing to appear cheaper in search results. Like putting something on eBay for $10 but charging $30 bucks for shipping? Of course, that's just speculation, but I have seen forums of Airbnb hosts asking each other how to manipulate the algorithm to get more bookings, so I wouldn't really be surprised. Doing things like delisting and relisting the same property to appear higher in search results as a new listing. So what's our Airbnb brother doing about it? Apparently Airbnb is rolling out a toggle in search results that displays the total price of a booking, including all the fees. By default, you're shown the nightly rate and the total price for the stay with fees included on the website now. And it really exposes what the hell is going on. Like, what is happening here? It's usually $3.86 a night, and they've discounted it during low season to $2.56 a night, but then the total for one night is still $4.63. It still ends up being more than the original nightly rate. A $150 cleaning fee is nearly 60% of the nightly rate. Another thing Airbnb Balls has done to combat these cleaning fees, or rather combat people taking advantage of cleaning fees to skew the algorithm, is adjusting the algorithm to rank listings by best total price instead of just the nightly rate. And the last thing Airbnb plans to do for now, they're going to start requiring hosts to post the cleaning list requirements on the listing before guests book. So we'll see if any of that works. So like I said earlier, customer satisfaction isn't the only reason that Airbnb hosts are reporting a sharp decline in bookings. Allow me to pull you deeper down into this iceberg. I'm like Edward's ghost overlooking Bella jumping off the fucking cliff. That's me and you right now. Tons of places online are seeing Airbnb hosts complain about the steep drop-off in bookings. And there are articles being written about the decline of Airbnb. Many citing that bookings are down up to 50% in certain cities like Phoenix, Arizona and Austin, Texas. But then what's this? Airbnb revenue has literally grown and been growing since the pandemic caused a dip. There's not really a decline in stays either. Bookings have grown over 18% in the last year. So what the heck is going on? There was a huge boom last year in 2022 when people could finally travel again for remote work or a socially distant travel option. And now the market is simply correcting itself as internet experts say. That in mind, Airbnb has also been seeing tens of thousands of new hosts join the platform every month. In 2023, as of making this, there are over 4 million hosts on the damn website. And over half of Airbnb's active listings have only been added in the past three years. The massive increase in supply in Airbnbs is no longer matching up with the slowing demand. Competition is higher than ever and average Airbnb prices are increasing. And that's definitely a contributing factor for individual Airbnb owners who once saw huge profit decline. So customer satisfaction, competition, too much supply for demand, rising prices, these are all reasons that Airbnb owners are seeing less profit. But Airbnb itself is rolling in the dough. But that's not the whole story. No, 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 no. Airbnb may have had their first profitable year in 2022 by making a lot of money, but the future of Airbnb is questionable. Let me just push you off this cliff one more time. In Oklahoma lives a quaint town of Hocha Town. The population is just 219 people, but on the weekends, it houses as many as 50,000 people. Rustic cabins have been replaced by $1 million rentals and grew from 400 cabins for rent pre-pandemic to over 2,400. It's a town that was created by Airbnb. The business registration manager at the Oklahoma Tax Commission, God, what a fun job title, says the town 
Town is basically one giant Airbnb, and Hocha Town is far from the only one. From a landlord's perspective, why not just do long-term rentals instead of Airbnb? You only gotta deal with one tenant and it's consistent money year-round. Well, because people found out that you can make a shit ton of money on Airbnb over long-term rentals. The short-term rental market in 2022 is estimated at over $100 billion. That's some Dr. Evil money. $100 billion! <laughs> because when there's the opportunity to exploit something for exponential money, the greedy goblins come out to suckle on the Airbnb tit. There are now huge corporations that buy out single-family homes, townhomes, condos, apartments, just to rent out as Airbnbs. There are entire developments and towns created near Disney in Orlando, Florida by investment companies for that exact purpose. New construction straight to Airbnb. It is turning local economies economies on their head. An entire industry was born again from the boom in short-term rentals. It's no longer individuals just renting out their second home that they already have for extra pocket change. It's entire companies that exponentially grew the Airbnb platform by buying properties in bulk basically, flipping them just to rent out as Airbnbs. It's so big there are even fake gurus selling courses on Instagram. Which is where you rent a property from a landlord and with their approval you can list this property on Airbnb. I've seen so many of these teaching you how to become an Airbnb property manager for people's listings. On one hand, it brings tourism dollars and boosts the local economy in that way, like in Oklahoma, where they usually mostly have, like, dust and tornadoes and football. I don't know, I've never been to Oklahoma. But that's what the head policy guy at Airbnb claims. I don't give a shit about him, nor do I trust him. Because on the other hand, with now companies buying up real estate in the thousands, it completely disrupts local housing markets. In case you missed it, there's nowhere for anyone to live. Affordably. In a 2019 study, the Economic Policy Institute found that the tourist dollars that short-term rentals bring in are outweighed by the shrinking long-term rental market and the drop in tax hotel revenue. Don't worry, I'll try not to make this section boring. You don't need a degree in real estate to understand this section of the video, like you do in some videos where it's an older gentleman explaining something and I'm really trying to pay attention, but you can't. I'm trying to buy a house. If you've noodled on buying a house in the past year or so, you've probably logged on to Zillow for 10 minutes and said, wow, Never mind. No matter where you are, the prices of homes have been well documented in absolutely skyrocketing. And of course, the whole blame isn't on Airbnb, but here's what happens. When tons and tons of people and companies are buying up the single family homes, condos, apartments, and sometimes even entire neighborhoods as we've learned, that means that there's less homes for the actual residents of that town to live in. More demand for housing and less homes means housing and rent prices go up. There's nowhere for my generation to live now. Most of my generation will never be able to afford a home, at least not until they're like 35, literally. Last year, the average first-time home buyer was 36 years old in the US. According to a report from a financial services company, Moody Analytics, a median income household in the United States would need to spend more than 30% of their income for an average price department. Anyway, why did this eruption even happen with the housing market in 2021? Basically, interest rates that you pay on your mortgage loan were at an all-time low like 3%. So investors saw this opportunity to invest in buying a bunch of housing to turn into short-term rentals. Because they knew that after the height of the pandemic, people would be rushing out to travel again. And they were right. And the home prices and rates were really good. So it was a perfect storm. So with everyone working from home who wanted more space or they could finally move around, plus investment companies buying a ton of real estate, home prices and interest began to increase. So that's the really simplified version of how we got to where we are today today. With record highs in housing and rent prices, and interest rates have shot up to over 8%, and with less housing available. According to Harvard Business Review and other sources, home sharing through Airbnb alone is responsible for about 20% of the average annual increase in US home prices, and a 14% increase in rent. According to a different source, AirDNA, Airbnb is responsible for just 1-3% to 3 of the housing price increase. Both 
Both of those seem drastically different, but both also seem to be reputable sources, so I don't know. Just putting that out there, the point is Airbnb does increase home prices in any given area. By how much is disputed. The rest of the housing price growth is due to general city trends, demographic changes, and other short-term rentals. In the city of Los Angeles alone, there are 17,294 entire homes or apartments on Airbnb. While there are only 8,862 homes, including condos, townhomes, apartments for sale in the entire LA County. And that's at an increase from earlier this year in June when there were only about 7,300 homes listed for sale, according to LA County MLS data. That is 17,000 homes in one small section of a city that could have been purchased or rented long-term. In Honolulu, Hawaii, there are roughly 8,000 entire home Airbnb listings, while there are only 1,900 homes for sale. I can't find data on the total number of places available for long-term rental, but regardless, it's undeniable that over 8,000 of potential homes are being taken away from permanent citizens in favor of short-term tourists. There is definitively less housing for people to live in with the growth in population, driving up housing and rent prices. Having a large saturation of Airbnbs in an area takes away the limited amount of housing from long-term residents, whether they rent or own. Bumping up rent prices also also displaces the people that already live there, pushing them out of the city even further. At this point, in some places, long-term renting has become just as expensive as mortgage payments when it was meant to not be. <laughs> now that's just a couple different American cities, but I assure you that this is affecting the entirety of the US. And if you live here, you probably know that. But zooming out, it's affecting the local housing of other countries and cities all over the globe. We have housing crises alongside Air Airbnb problems in cities like Barcelona, London, Paris, Singapore, Berlin, Copenhagen, just to name a few. But it's me again. Now, of course, it's important to remember that Airbnb isn't the only cause of the housing crisis. I think it's popular to use short-term rentals as a scapegoat when you can't find a house, like I have, I'll admit it. But as Vox pointed out, the housing problem has more to do with the lack of housing supply, only partially at fault of short-term rentals like Airbnb. Because since the Great Recession, home builders haven't been building enough new homes to keep up with the growing population, at least in the US. New home construction has definitely been ramping up, but the pandemic, supply chain issues, and higher costs in borrowing money means it's gonna take at least a few years to make any corrections to the market that way. Additionally, even though home prices are pretty high right now, people aren't putting their homes for sale. Because even if they sell their home right now for a nice ass profit, home prices are astronomical everywhere else too, with higher interest rates. In March of 2019, there were about a million homes on the market in the US. And as of March 2023, there were only about 500,000, which was still at peak prices and interest rates. If someone bought their house a few years ago with a record low interest rate of 3%, they're not gonna trade that for a 7% interest rate unless they absolutely have to move. You tired of talking about the housing market? Trust me, me too. The iceberg goes deeper. Can you believe it? So far, we've covered the problems within the service of Airbnb, like fees and inconsistent quality, and Airbnb's effects on the greater housing market. But there's actually something deeper and even more sinister going on, and it just keeps getting worse. Which is how this video ended up being so long. Save me. Slave me. Slave me. Slave me. Many Airbnbs actually break the law. Ooh, the law. Someone replied to my tweet about this video asking if Airbnb was legal or if they're working in some sort of gray area. To which my first reaction was, well, of course it's legal. Why would it be illegal to rent out a property you already own? And then, well, I found out in some places it's kinda not legal. Or at least they have heavy regulations that aren't being followed. In Copenhagen's popular Norborough district, a resident says, my building is half a hotel now. Bro? Nori bro. No. Nori bro. Okay.
Oops. I am sorry in advance, I am going to be pronouncing this the English way. The building owner has been turning apartments into Airbnbs, they say, but tenants haven't complained because their names risk being made public. Pointing out illegal Airbnbs to the authorities would alert him to my involvement and my life would become hell. Illegal Airbnbs? Airbnbs and residential apartments or condominiums aren't always allowed. Either the building manager doesn't allow Airbnbs or the lay of the law comes down from the city itself trying to regulate Airbnbs in residential areas. I once stayed in an Airbnb in an apartment where there was a sign letting people know that Airbnbs in this building are forbidden. And I was none the wiser at the time. I was like, huh, that's peculiar and kind of for the host to do, but there's a reason. Frankly, neighbors don't like Airbnbs, and some people's entire residential buildings have turned into Airbnbs. Tourists who don't care about the noise level or have courtesy for the people who live there, because to them, it's just like a hotel. In New York City, residents who complain about rule breaking in their building have reported that they themselves were subsequently evicted. Holy hell. So policymakers in cities around the world are starting to gather like the Avengers to introduce laws to limit the detrimental impact of Airbnbs in their area. Local governments know that Airbnb is disrupting their rental and housing supply, especially pushing locals out of city centers. So cities are finally starting to take different approaches to combat the problem. Denmark banned full-time Airbnbs in 2018. New York City, LA, San Francisco, the entire state of Florida, and many other places have started to require short-term rental licenses, permits, and extra fees, an additional tourism tax, sometimes state sales tax, and sometimes county tax. Those cities, plus Vancouver, Tokyo, and others, made it so you can only rent if the host is actively living on the property. San Francisco, London, Paris, Amsterdam, Copenhagen, and others have capped the number of nights Airbnb hosts are allowed to rent out, ranging from 30 to 120 days a year. In New York City, Singapore, Honolulu, LA, or Orlando, tons of cities are starting to outright ban short-term rentals of 30 days or less. These are huge cities and there are more. This is going to have a big impact on Airbnbs if they're enforced. They have to have a minimum stay of 30 plus days. Some cities have the minimum even longer. Dallas has introduced specific zoning to prevent Airbnbs in residential areas. And Seattle limits how many Airbnbs you can own to two. But if you've been paying close attention and not folding your laundry, damn it again, you'll have noticed that while Copenhagen limits the number of nights per year, uh, people are still doing it and taking over residential areas anyway. No matter the permits, laws, or regulations, they're just not being enforced and unlicensed Airbnbs aren't getting fined. The rules are hard to enforce. But with recent increasing regulations, cities are finally starting to put their foot down and enforce these rules. More taxes, higher taxes, fines, fees, and legal limitations finally have these landlords shaking in their boots. Some cities have been semi-successful so far. Airbnb reported that since April of 2023, San Francisco has removed over 700 listings, and companies with multiple listings have chosen to remove almost 200 of them. In St. In Petersburg, Florida, I found an Airbnb forum of landlords talking about how one woman is going on a rampage and reporting every Airbnb listing in a single family home and getting their listings subsequently removed because they're running unlicensed Airbnbs and breaking rules of how many nights they can rent out. And then they have the audacity to play victims in this thread. And these guys knew about the restrictions in the city and still decided to do it anyway. And then complain that my girl Laura is reporting everyone. One dude bought a $900,000 home in St. Pete. The mortgage was $4,200 a month. In order to comply with the new minimum stay of 30 days, he now lists that home at $5,000 a month and then admitted to it sitting empty. How insane is that? I don't feel bad for you, man. This is a place that people are trying to live in with very limited housing since there is no space to expand and build new homes there. You can see it on a map. And you bought a million dollar home contributing to the housing crisis and upcharging for rent an extra $9,600 a year of the mortgage that you decided to take out. Unfortunately, at the end of this forum is a very telling statement. St. Pete should really consider loosening up on the short-term situation. It's really such a bummer. I wonder how to go about relaxing these regulations. The written rule in the city of St. Pete is 30 day min with three stays, less than 30 days per
permitted per year. The only time I see this being enforced is if a neighbor complains. Exactly what my realtor told me. Yeah, and there are tax loopholes. Hosts can split their listing between websites, and hosts can submit multiple listings for the same property to get around the limitations, but still. It would help to know what the city's rationale was for such stringent rules. I'm trying really hard not to be mean here, but I just wish these people had more critical thinking skills. There's the cause and effect. These regulations are now in place, so if you look at the data now, you'll see that an insane amount of these listings have now switched to a 30-day minimum to comply with the new laws, or to avoid short-term rental fees for stays under 30 days. In LA, stays shorter than 30 days require you to upload a permit with the city, but stays over 30 days, you don't have to. I don't care about your car. And that explains why the minimum stay graph looks like this. But converting your Airbnb to long-term stays means less profit, usually. And there's one more thing that's scaring Airbnb landlords away. More laws, ooh, more laws, woo. In another thread with interested Airbnb investors in LA, I'm in the trenches, you guys. These threads are equal parts insufferable and entertaining. <laughs> Most of the country has laws that treat stays of over 30 days as long-term rentals, which in turn gives tenants more rights than short-term renters have. If your renter refuses to pay you or refuses to leave, you have to go through the courts to evict. Once you have a rental booked over 30 days, it allows guests to qualify for more rights than a typical vacation rental, I think, in most places in the US. And other people on this thread just flat out said, don't bother doing business in California, it's not worth it. Landlords don't want to deal with tenants having rights <laughs> and more protections. So that's another thing that's been scaring some hosts away from the platform. That statistic about bookings being down up to 50% in major cities, but Airbnb's revenue is still climbing, now makes a whole lot more sense. This is all happening around the same time that cities are either making regulations or finally starting to enforce them. So if Airbnbs are getting harder to rent out, some people are wondering, are people going to start giving up their Airbnb properties and dumping them back onto the housing market? Would that mean it would fix the housing shortage? No, of course not. Nothing is ever that simple. Come on now. As we discussed earlier, Airbnb isn't the sole cause of the housing crisis, and an Airbnb crash wouldn't fix it either. An Airbnb crash wouldn't even indicate a greater housing crash. The broader housing market still faces a shortage of inventory. This limited inventory coupled with sustained demand creates a scenario where a housing crash is unlikely. As the Federal Reserve government people keeps the interest rates stable, there is suppressed demand waiting for more favorable market conditions. That's most of us. So even if a bunch of Airbnbs got dumped onto the market, it wouldn't make a significant change to help the prices go down, really. Even just from me window shopping on Zillow for the past couple of years, it's pretty clear a bunch of investment properties are being dumped onto the market and haven't been helping very much. Every Airbnb on a national level would have to dump their homes on the market to cause a significant housing crash. Plus, rural areas without quality hotels would likely suffer from tourism money if their Airbnbs were to disappear. I hope you enjoyed the unnecessarily long video today. If you made it to the end, consider subscribing and sharing this video with a friend or an enemy. I make video essays and general commentary videos that can range from a more lighthearted topic to a more in-depth one like this video. As always, thank you so much to my patrons and feel free to click on this video that YouTube thinks you will like. Okay, bye.